All right, welcome to this week's Casual Conversations in Cybersecurity. Uh, we are really excited to host Nadia um, on this week's conversation, talking more about um, the human factor in um, you know, cybersecurity and in a, in, you know, mitigating insider threat. So Nadia, thank you so much for joining us. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and uh, we'll just go from there. Thank you for having me. So do you want to uh, know something about my actual background or about my... <laughs> <laughs> <Both>. <laughs> This was like my uh, my Dutch joke of the day. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. So a little bit about me. I uh, I come from my background is in NATO, in the, always in the information and communication um, environment. I've worked there for almost nearly two decades. So uh, if I may say so myself, well conserved two decades and still going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started very early on. But uh, I worked in different environments. And as you know, NATO, it's very security oriented, oriented and we worked a lot with cyber security and digital transformation. And I was always part of the team that did uh, stakeholder engagement and the cultural aspect. How do you have you know, people adopt a security mindset first without being a barrier to innovation, without being a barrier to the different business units? So the agency I worked with had enterprise model, and we were responsible for securing, delivering, acquisition of software to NATO member nations. So I worked in various departments, and after 18 years, I hit uh, hit burnout. And for me, it was a, it was a sign. Okay, what do we do now, Nadia? What do you want to do with your life? So I went deep, and I said, well, let's start emotional intelligence and help people. Uh, thrive in in an environment with all these security challenges. Now, mind you, I had no clue that COVID was on the way. <laughs> with, uh, thank God, because that may have uh, changed my decision. But um, actually, that also helped me really focus on uh, the work that I do now, building healthy security culture through human resilience, because we have to rethink Right? It's kind of a social contract or social digital contract. How does human behavior influence the way we work, the way we think? If you think about it, because of COVID, I think that you know there's a lot of um, statistics about that. Uh, has cybercrime has spiked up because mm -hmm. of human service attack. Many people are working remotely. Many people are working, you know, uh, under uh, not normal circumstances. We're still facing a pandemic and right. there comes a lot of uncertainty and on, on ambiguity and complexity and everything is piling up, right? It's kind of a too many changes at the same time. So mm -hmm. when you think about criminology, right? I did a little bit of criminology during my studies as well. How do criminals pick up, uh, pick out their victims, right? It's based on their body language, on the vibes they get, on the right. vulnerability, right? On this okay. one is easier. They, they, there's there's loads of examples, but not necessarily who is the bigger or you know who can who is less likely to over empower them. So when you yeah. apply that mindset into the cyber crime we see now, and you don't necessarily have to be a cyber criminal, you can be a scammer or commercial spionage, right? Yeah. This is what. Uh, the work that I do actually focus on helping uh, organizations and people become more aware to not necessarily come from a place of human vulnerability, but the human empowerment, because the way we work, our digital footprint, right, gives criminals, scammers, people with malicious intent, bad actors, uh, avenue to uh, hack human minds, right, social right. engineering, emotional manipulation. And this is part of the equation. Technology solution is very important to reduce the human surface attack, right? To not uh, cause so much burden on people. Humans are not human firewalls. But if you don't adopt this as a culture, a security culture first, right? And understanding how can we change habits, not necessarily personalities or turning everyone into cyber warriors. Yeah. And that can go a long way in creating a more resiliency also at the human level, right? It's people, process, technology, and the World Economic Forum calls for cyber resiliency. So don't think you're not going to be hacked or compromised, but act as if. Now, you need to have organizational resilience. Is at what level? 
it's processes, technology, but how are we going to build human resilience, right? So this is the way I focus on, which I call uh, um, human resilience and, and, and use uh, emotional firewalls. We have firewalls in our computer to make sure we navigate and we manage access control of what gets infected and not. But the human mind is not a computer, it's flesh, it's organ, right? So how do we protect uh, uh, the, the um, triggers, the outside stimuli, on our own way of functioning, on how we communicate, how we collaborate, how we coordinate to reduce the risk, the business risk that, that plays into the human risk, the technological risk, the financial risk, uh, uh, all the parameters that organizations work with. So in a nutshell, this is what I do. Uh, uh, this is what I do, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really fascinating. Like, so when you say emotional, um, like the emotional firewalls, right? Like, how, what does that look like? Because immediately I think emotional and I think, oh, you know, the, the negative connotations, right? Like women, oh, they're so emotional. And, you know, that like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so how do you, how does that, like, how do you apply that? How do you, how do you convey to people um, who, yeah. who, you know, the regular user um, who doesn't, who doesn't even think about it or they just like, Oh, it's no use. You know, I'd explain the importance and like, you know, like maybe even a concrete example would be. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Because uh, there is uh, unfortunately emotional intelligence has, has gotten a little bit of superficial uh, reputation because mm -hmm. yeah. we have all, you know, and I, I'm not, not judging anyone here, but when we, look at life coaches or EQ coaches, we're all about, you know, self-awareness and emotional, et cetera, whatever is the latest buzzword to get people to react, right? right. Well, in essence, emotional intelligence is, is far more uh, interesting, fascinating and relevant to that than what is portrayed on the superficial. So I am a neuroscience geek, so I do a lot of neuroscience uh, studies, but uh, one of the things I try to keep it simple in order to explain uh, uh, why emotional intelligence and why why we use the symbolism symbolism of emotional firewalls in the context of security to help people. So when we think about uh, when I what I just said is the the and I'm going to make a bold statement and uh, allow me the time to explain. Our okay. brain, the most important job of the brain is not to think, <laughs> it's to survive. Right? And there's been a lot of research that, uh, that talks about this. One great, uh, fabulous neuroscientist, Lisa Feldman Barrett, has written books, How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain, and uh, also has a lot of videos and TED Talks about this, which she goes far more into detail. So for anyone interested, I definitely recommend uh, you to look into that. What was no, what is Lisa Feldman Barrett. Okay. okay. We also have another one, Andrew Huberman, who also f f focuses on the on the neuroscience and talks a little bit about how emotions are linked. So there's a lot of research and and and, and stuff out there. But why is this important to understand? Now, there are there is a differentiation to be made between feelings, right, general feelings and emotions. General feelings, which scientists also call effect. Now, how does this happen? Imagine you work in an organization, enterprise model. The job of the CEO or the board of directors is to ensure there are optimal resources in each department, acquisition, finance, IT, legal, innovation, marketing, HR, in order for the organization to be able to operate and even make profit and thrive, right? The brain is a body budget regulator. So its most important job is for us to survive, is to ensure we have enough optimal energy in all of our organs. What happens when we experience an energy deficit? So we had consecutive bad nights of sleep. We feel tired. We don't have enough energy, whatever it is. Then we're experiencing an energy deficit. The brain communicates very subconsciously. You're not even aware of there is, you know, a, a general feeling of perhaps frustration or sadness or, or uh, you know, you experience the energy deficit as a general feeling, which scientists call effect. These are not necessarily emotion or much more complex. An effect is universal across the globe. Every single human being has general feelings, right? And this is related to the energy intake, right? based also on the information, the sensations we perceive from the outside world, 
which is very relevant in today's world because cognitive overload. We are bombarded by information everywhere from right, left, above, and below. Right? But it also is based on our formative years and past experiences. And here's where emotions come in. And here's where it's not universal for everyone. And here's where bias and stereotypes come in. Because whatever you learned, you see the world as we are, not as it is. From your formative years, between zero and seven years old, that's how you come up with concepts. You learn concepts, what emotions are related to. How do we learn how sadness looks like? We learned mm -hmm. it early on, right? How do we know what joy looks like? So, and this is how we associate emotions with thoughts, with the beliefs we have. This is why, and, and then we have, you know, our experience. For example, a uh, very, very simple example. If, for example, during our talk right now, there is a, uh, a, 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 um, a big electronic, you know, uh, image on the, that scares me, right? My the emotion, the negative emotions with that memory, with that information becomes kind of, if it's intense enough, a memory. So in the future, if we're going to have another life, I'm going to be very cautious, right? The negative emotions are prevalent. Example at workplace, right? If you are working on a project and something gone really wrong on that project, and even, and you experience negative emotion, intense negative emotion because of the, the context, the, the environment, the colleagues, the boss, whatever it is. Next time you're going to work on a project, you're likely going to be, you know, uh, coming up with the same emotion to drive your behavior because it takes up too much energy. This is what we call Daniel Kiyo Kahneman, who's Nobel Prize winner in this uh, research area. System one of the brain is our shortcut mental models, is our go-to response to in order mm -hmm. to manage our energy. Right? So being aware of the difference between general feelings, that if you had bad nights of sleep and you feel angry or frustrated, maybe you need to get some food. Maybe you need to go out and exercise. Maybe you need, you know, it's, it's internal. It's not necessarily because of uh, what something happens. So it's important to be self-aware as well. And when it comes to emotions, what is our bias? What is our belief? And here, when we look at cybersecurity, right, if we think cybersecurity from a very narrow perspective, that it's only, uh, it's very niche, it's only technological implications, it's only reserved for the few, it's only, uh, etc because of the history of cybersecurity and the evolution of it, then people who, who are very technically wired or their mind is very technically trained are going to be very uncomfortable, right, in, 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 in talking to uh, others, for example, who, who have a very different view of cyber, or who don't believe cybersecurity is important to their work. So why is this? So emotional firewalls is, in essence, twofold. In one fold is to protect yourself against social engineering because the criminals we face on the street are now all invisible online, right? And these mm -hmm. translate in scammers, in you know, uh, commercial espionage and ransomware attacks. It's a wide variety of, of crimes that really try to get people based on positive emotion. We are seeing now romance scam and Valentine's Day coming up, right? right. So they 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 really trigger that positive emotion so we like people who like us we you know our defense mechanisms go down or even if if you want to have access identity control if you use words and you connect with the person they are less likely to ask empowering questions or curiosity or think what someone's motives is right, right. if you are distracted if you're filled with stress or you are you know having a lot of energy deficit you may be less alert it is also about how do we secure our user environment. So emotional firewalls is understand to react on reason, not on impulse, to allow the emotion to, 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 to pass. Emotions are energy in motion, right? To understand that the thought creates the emotion, so to wait, to reflect. And this like is very- you you're being triggered. You know, exactly. So. And, and there was an interesting New York Times article, the ransomware gang, Darkseid, that uh, was also responsible for the colonial pipeline attack. They actually found some secret chats in, in, in the, uh, I believe it was a, a Russian group or a Russian attack of branch of, of this 
highly organized organization that actually was uh, proud of how they used fear monitoring language for educational institutions to ask for information. Otherwise, they will put pictures of the children online for pedophiles right? and how they actually managed to prey on people's fear. And they actually intercepted the message saying, oh, my God, you know, they actually believe this. They, we, we really got them into their fears. So this is why it's important to understand you may be very intellectually resilient. You may be very good at what you do. But when we go to people's what is important to us right? mm -hmm. here, we right. go into the survival mode, into the system one of the brain. And, and this is not to create fear, but to be practical. How do mm -hmm. you exercise? How do you exercise also the emotional state? How do you teach people to not react, right? To not uh, be actually necessarily very, to think things true. Because again, the brain's primary job is not for thinking, right? It, of course we think, but when we feel cornered, when we feel defensive, when we feel under pressure, right? We, right. uh, uh, we tend, not everyone, right? I think I, I, in NATO, this was our bread and butter. So we were either in conflict or on, uh, not in conflict. We are very uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. And this is it. Emotional right. firewalls help you become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Wow. That's, it's so fascinating. I really hear so many different like applications um, and instances of when, you know, incidents have occurred or could occur. Um, we have a, we have quite a few uh, comments from the audience and thank you so much guys for um, chiming in. We have a couple. Um, we have one who was uh, saying, you know, it'd be interesting to know your view on building emotional and psychological resilience in the face of a cyber incident and the escalation to that cyber crisis event. So one of, one of the things I do as well is uh, simulations, right? And okay. both simulations in a technical environment, if it's really for technical people to uh, also incorporate the human uh, part in it, but also solely on the emotional, uh, psychological aspect. Because what happens, right? Organizations have incident response plan, right? Or crisis mm -hmm. management team. And we have a, a, a representative from each department. Now, when you come together in meetings, right? Everything seems kumbaya because no one really feels the pressure or understands the pressure of how, it, how how will you react, right? If you are in the middle of a crisis and for example, the CEO is demanding for answers right away, putting a lot of pressure while raising his voice or her uh, tone of voice just because of the situation. Now, how do people react? Now, you want, you want to have an incident response team who has high levels of emotional intelligence, who is able to work through that during pressure, right? How do make the how does decision making is is exercised? Human error occurs based on skill set or decision making. So it's all about building preparedness, exercising, and 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 building awareness and understanding where someone's own level of emotional intelligence lies and how to strengthen it or balance it out. Emotional intelligence is not static. Anyone can 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 uh, hone it, right? It's not a it's not like your IQ that is usually kind of set at the age of 17. Although there are, I also am a big believer of increasing our neuroplasticity, so the new neural networks and learning more, which is uncomfortable. It takes effort. So I think uh, one of the things is to understand that there are known risks that are exercised risk, but there are always novel risks and how people face them in peacetime when we feel safe and secure is very different when we feel under pressure. And when you provide that safe and psychological safe environment, right, I use a lot of role play, a lot of uh, creativity, fun, in order to get people to learn without the intense negative emotion and create new perspectives, right, to build understanding, to build the competency and skill set that they need in their map of the world. And I'll come back to this. And then the coaching in order to how do we make it personal for them? Because a marketing manager versus a, a research and development manager versus a legal advisor, they do not know that they do not need to know the same thing about cybersecurity, right? There as the basics on patching, updates, etc., multi-factor authentication, 
the colonial pipeline attack, right? One of the biggest, uh, 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 they, they actually, the CEO came out and said it was because of a single password. Not because the password was not complex, but there was no multi-factor authentication. And this is an issue for many, many organizations, right? It's really how do you get people to build security safety habits in their map of the world? We are overloaded with information, right? right. We do not need to know right. the whole cybersecurity handbook in order to protect ourselves. But what how can you help people understand in their map of the world based on their experience and based on what they are and this requires you know training is just one part of it but it's definitely not the part of it it requires leadership top down but also cross functional it requires management right coaching and training because all managers now not only the IT manager or the CISO are responsible for security safety how do they help their team make it an ingrained as part of their day-to-day -day work and not an afterthought and not making it a burden, but as a bliss, as I say, because many people see cybersecurity or security as a burden. But when right. you make it clear in their map of the world, right, this is how you build new habits. Right. Well, I think um, we have another um, audience member who's talking about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and talking about, you know, some of the issues around belonging um, connect not just to positively when thinking about constructing a positive security culture, but also to fitting into society along with norms and and how social engineering plays on this. Um, what, my question is is with the positive security culture, how do you how do you how do you incorporate, you know, that's a lot of training, I think, for you know, if it's each manager over their department, you're having to train them how to be more self-aware so they can help their teammates like how how does that look what does that look like in creating like the programs you're speaking about so it's uh, i uh, i love that question i uh, uh, i wrote also about uh, uh, maslow hierarchy of needs and i think microsoft published a brilliant paper on how there we have a different My Maslow hierarchy of needs now that is digital, right? Because the first layer is food, shelter, security. But right. what happens, right, when the internet went down, when we can't use Facebook or WhatsApp or do our lives and take our selfies, right? <laughs> I mean, oh God, the world's ending, right? Then we have to actually talk to people and connect with them in line, uh, on, in, in person. So I'm, I'm joking a little bit, but it is a serious issue, right? Because how <laughs> what is you know those layers so i think the learning part that i use is building understanding competency skill set and then the the new habits and for each organization it, there's no one size fits all it has to be tailored to their business strategy and their culture strategy however there is one uh, uh, common line when 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 understanding uh, how to have you know uh, understanding what success looks like and and it, it, it's not necessarily positive culture, right? I use healthy culture because you know one end you have toxic and the other one you have positive. We live in the world. In reality, is we navigate between. Sometimes mm. we have really bad days. It's not an excuse for toxic behavior, but our behavior has a positive intent and it does not translate in such a way. Right. It doesn't mean we are bad people or good people or negative people. Right? I think it's really important to understand the difference between uh, optimism, right? It's acknowledging the challenges. How do we move forward? And positivity, because positivity can become toxic. Some mm. people are thriving in this time. Other people are really mm. suffering. Right, so there's this in between. But the other thing I, I wanted to say is applying a generational diverse lens. We have a workforce with up to five different generations, right? And how the generation Z, so the, the digital natives and millennials see the world is different than baby boomers and generation X, right? And right. especially when we talk about millennials or 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 the, or I don't want to generalize, I don't like generalizing because sometimes we use it to polarize and to you know everyone you know people are complex but just for the purpose of my explanation and this life is uh, millennials or gen z tend tend to be brilliant you know uh, uh, minds but perhaps they lack the life experience or the emotional resilience so they are more likely to fall for social engineering attacks they're more likely you know how their lifeline is social media and their mobile phone for many right so if you're yeah. going to have 
security and then they cannot use it, this is going to be an issue. And it is important to think about these questions. Now you have the other end, right, Generation X or baby boomers who have very healthy levels of resilience and not easily fooled, right? But then the, the, the pride, right, how they perceive themselves as well and how are they going to work, collaborate, communication, coordination, influences the success of implementing such a culture. So what I always do in everything I do <coughs> to, to break down silos, to reduce organizational blindness, to foster empathy, seek to understand before being understood, understand everyone has a story, everyone has different interests. This was at NATO, what we did a lot, right? We have different committees and drive, and we already went through this when we adopted cyber as operational domain and an important work strand, which was uh, across all the sectors was the human and cultural. It was a cultural. How do you get people to be much more aware when they use, for example, NATO restricted or, or uh, classified information on the mobile device, right? There's not only technical security, but if someone is pushed by their manager to deliver something the next day, right? Yeah. How likely are they going to use their Gmail account or their Google Drive and forget to put on the, you know, the password protection, right? Mm -hmm. It's all kinds of consequences. So it's really understanding human behavior and meeting people where they are. And this is not a quick fix, right? Because uh, uh, now we are tra trading speed against time. We want things yesterday. Right. But when it comes to people, you need to have, you know, objectives, you need to be able to measure it, right? But you won't see an immediate change. You can see quick fixes, right, in certain areas when, like, for example, just, you know, multi-factor authentication. It's, it's, it's for me, it should be given for any organization. Yes, it mm -hmm. takes a bit more time, et cetera, but if you, do, if you only use one password, and, and you don't have multi-factor authentication as a minimum installed, that's already opening up for, you know, uh, uh, trouble. And, and, right. and many think, well, why would I be hacked? And this is just fear monitoring. And maybe you won't be hacked, but there are loads of examples, those who have been hacked, the pain, the cost of money is not even coming close to the physical and human pain, especially when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, people who have... Uh, put their sweat and blood in their business, entrepreneurs, small businesses, etc. But even corporations. So, yeah. no, there's a lot. It, there's a lot. It, it just has that ripple effect. Um, Danny has a really great comment. Um, she's saying, Nadia, it's clear um, that the security is a people business, and the practitioners need to learn to translate the ones and O's to a more effective business communication among themselves. Um, but how do you propose security practitioners and vendors selling these solutions to those practitioners to break barriers or those emotional firewalls on both sides so that everyone can become more effective in minimizing risk? A very good question, because sometimes I get the comments or the, you know, that I am that, you know, it's really interesting how we perceive in dichotomy. Right. If you focus on the human factor, it means you're not interested in technology, which is couldn't be further from the truth, right? Yeah. But what I always advise and work with my clients is to not see this in silo. So the HR mm -hmm. function and the IT, right? Uh, sometimes I had a client who purchased security solutions that come with the technical training, right? You're not gonna generate new habits by putting people once a month or once a week in front of a series of case scenarios where they, you know, there is no sensation. We learn through our senses, through remembering, through making mistakes. So our brain, you know, uh, uh, learns new information uh, just by how to use the how to use the new system or how to protect themselves. So it's really an integrated approach now between a, the HR department and uh, the, the IT or the chief information, chief technology or chief information security officer, if, if um, he or she are the ones that report to the, to the board, uh, part of the C-suite team, in order to understand what, is the, what are the performance challenges. Right? Mm -hmm. what, and, and I think this is really important because we are easy to buy technology, fancy technology, right? But what are the organizational performance challenges, right? What are the risks when it comes to human, technological, business, you know, the, your risk profile? And what then do you need to overcome those obstacles, right? 
human firewalls or technology, for example, uh, there, there are loads of technology that can already reduce the, the phishing attacks, the emails, right? Mm -hmm. Or filter throughout uh, something that, that may be a scam or uh, to avoid having spoofed websites so people don't you know, get their access credentials stolen. However, what is also happening now, because unfortunately in those scammers, they get also you know, more educated, they use very personalized words that speak to people's emotions, right? Now you already have reduced the risk, but then you still have the human risk. How do you ad address that? Now then you address that through the human factor. How are you helping people, for example, using AI technology or other services to use? Not everyone is very comfortable to adopt that technology uh, you know, immediately. People have different levels of flexibility. So there are so many things that come into play. And I, uh, so from a personal perspective, I, I never offer just you know, you know, training or, or, or this solution. It's, it's really understanding what are your performance challenges, where do you want to be one year from now? How is your organization standing and thriving in this digital disruptive right. environment? And what are the what do you already have in place? Because you know that there are something sometimes clients have already things in place, and you just need to tweak the strategy or the the mm -hmm. the, the way we educate or work with people a little bit, and uh, and take it step by step. And the step by step is very important, right? And and to really, if you're a security provider, to really understand your clients problem right to mm -hmm. not so important we talked about this or you talked about this a few weeks ago not to sell yourself this is not about you this is not the you know you are developing an amazing solution that can literally help reduce people's decision fatigue and mental fatigue but focus on the problem what is their problem and if you can solve the problem don't sell them something just because we want to make you know a few bucks if making few bucks is important so we satisfy the first and second layer of mass law hierarchy but really focus on understanding the problem and and, and this requires uh, a more holistic long answer but i hope i answer <laughs> no that's great and we have another uh, another uh, listener talk made a comment i think employee happiness continues to be overlooked when we talk about security um, if you hold a strong, positive emotional connection with your job, colleagues, and organization, you trigger a protection response um, and a protective mindset that can significantly, significantly benefit the security resilience. Um, so talking a little more about, you know, insider threat and how to kind of mitigate that, uh, I think this is kind of an interesting segue into uh, speaking just a little bit to that, that side of the um, equation. Yeah. There was an interesting article or study done in the Harvard Business Review that actually mentioned inside the threat, you know, inside it, what is inside the threat? Inside the threat is the activities what people are doing that put your organization at risk. Now, uh, they, can, they can be malicious, right? So it's really intentional, whether it's based on personal grievances, whether it's based on, you know, getting revenge, whether it's based on a toxic girl, uh, work culture, whether it's based because ransomware is a service now, it's a model, so you want to make easy money, whatever it is. But often also is the case, it's unintentional, it's human error, right? And right. human error, again, I explained skill set decision. Now, human error has always been a risk that different organizations tolerated to a certain extent. Now we are working in a, in a pandemic, right, with many security. So decision fatigue is real. Right? Mm -hmm. yes. Human error is unevitable. So, and when we talk about insider threat, the word threat already is kind of putting people on, you know, alarm or fear. Yeah. And you may think that if you use fear or carrot and stick, that beh behaviors will change. They will try to, they did a study on this as well, they will try to reduce the fear and not change habits, right? So it's really understanding that a healthy culture healthy security mm -hmm. culture is so important to minimize the risk. And this is what we had in NATO, for example, for years. For example, we knew very well that if we had a security violation, right, we were going to be seated in the security officers and get our, you know, our uh, assessment or our talk. Not one occasion, right, do we feel ashamed, or at least not in my time, 
or blamed, right? There was no, it wasn't something, it was something like to be avoided and to be careful because of the nature of our work, but it wasn't something related to ourselves as employees, right? And, and, and I think that is finding the balance to take it seriously enough to be really well aware and to, if you, you know, if, if also when we saw something that was out of order, we reported it. But this is also so important to have that critical mindset and to understand is how are you arranging your access control and identity access to certain people? Because if you have a team and they are very close to each other and maybe someone has, you know, uh, unintentional, intentional behavior, they're going to overlook it or not report it, for example, right? So it is, I think, one side is, yes, you have to have that human resilience and have security as a mindset, as an enabler, not based on fear. But you also need to have systems in place and to understand, right, which the, 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 the emotional intelligence levels of certain people with what access, right? For me, for example, and maybe this is my Dutch mindset, is trust is good, checking is, is better. <laughs> I, I do get full sometimes. I know I, we are all human beings. Sure. Because of my mindset and nature, it's very difficult. I, I have no problem asking questions, etc. And I think you want to understand how do people feel in your culture? Are they empowered to ask questions with kindness? Are they, you know, be curious? Because when we are triggered, those positive hormones, we let our defenses down, right? When, mm -hmm. And that's when it's the most uh, actually also vulnerable to make mistakes or to be uh, be scammed. So I think insider threat, the word can actually trigger a lot of fear. So as an organization, how are you going to incorporate it in your HR programs to build healthy cultures and security is, is ingrained in it. It's not an afterthought. I think that is a great kind of segue to this question. Uh, someone put, you know, how if there's any experiences about how to use social proof to influence the C-suite to be more engaged in prioritizing cyber, you know, how, how do you how do you sell? Like, what, what's kind of a good, you know, approach to uh, opening these conversations to where they're actually productive and being heard? Yeah. Yes, uh, very good question. So I, I hear you, I use my experience in NATO and I'll just say, share this anecdote is uh, especially in my last position, we had a lot of you know policy papers or solutions to the ambassadors or representative of each nation to adopt. And often what happened from the outside, they came with big bang solutions, big bang approach that was not able to be implemented in that environment, right? So the phased approach is very important. And one of the, 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 the wins actually is that when we started, our agency was seen as a supplier after and right at the end. But through a lot of work, stakeholder engagement, influence strength strategy, we really managed to become one of, you know, an important pillar in enabling NATO's digital endeavor and posture. So uh, I always say step approach. Actually, there's one client I, I worked with, I, First, start with you know the the managers, the awareness building, etc., and then think about okay, C-suite have very little time. Uh, right. Everyone has very little time, but it's a very different uh, map of the world based on their portfolio. So creating you know use ease of use for their experience and helping them reduce business risk from their map of the world, enhancing their quality of work and security is part of that is actually what gets them to listen and adopt. You have to communicate outside in, right? If you're talking to a C-suite, for example, chief financial officer, right? They're interested in the financial aspects. They're interested in right. the, you know, the, the, the business continuity disruption and the cost, right? Per breach or how long does it cost? This is what they're interested in, all these questions. So if you come from a perspective that is your map of the world, we need to invest in this solution because etc. that's not going to resonate with CFO. CEO, right, customer stakeholder engagement, reputational damage. There are laws being passed, right, that are going to hold accountable C-suite for lack of negligence. And this is really big. 
and and we can say we have insurances but i think there was even a recent bank of ireland right uh, uh, where the insurance policy actually insurance mar market is getting saturated there's a lot of caveat and fine prints uh, definitely do not necessarily guaranteeing that you are going to be able to uh, uh, get paid in addition there is even a law in the us I forgot the name of the specific law, but in some cases, when it comes to ransomware, if you decide to pay based mm -hmm. on what you pay for, you can even be listed, right, as 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 uh, uh, blacklisted, and then you can not only get fined, but even perhaps get you know a penalty in in in, in you know, judiciary ways. So again, this is not to be fear mongering, but to understand how do we communicate the risk in the C suites map of the world. These are functions with high levels of responsibility, 500 right. things at the same time. I always had one pager. I used to work for the general manager. What does success look like? What are the three key messages? And a few bullet points. It's all he needed to know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. And, and, and the, the last thing I will say to replace being patronizing. Sometimes I see art or I read articles. They talk as C-suite doesn't do not know anything about cybersecurity, right? And you're just going to have the opposite effect. They're very smart people. They're very, you know, I, I used to work with, you know, high level uh, military leaders who were responsible, secure for in major operational area environment. He knew exactly, you know, what happened and how it happened because of how decentralization, information, decision making, how the process and the people were trained to communicate outside in. I think this is really important. Wow. Yeah, it really um, just listening to you talk and really kind of breaking it down. It really is um, a big job that the CISOs and the cybersecurity teams they're not just doing the technical aspect. They're really, ha you know, having to convey such a human, a human, you know, reaction and understanding of different human, you know, um, characteristics and personality types and how they understand. And, like it's not such an easy, not not an easy task, you know. So no, it's really hard technically, and you yeah. throw in the human element, it just really is mind-boggling to think of the um, challenges. And to have empathy and compassion for the, the IT and CISO, because if we look at our own example, when something's not working, immediately we expect the IT to do it, you know, yesterday. And, and we also confuse IT and cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. Prevention is a very different skill set and brain skill set than detection and recovery, right? These are very different skill sets and increase decision fatigue. And I think, can you imagine if you are someone who always detects, right? And, mm -hmm. and prevent you're you're always expecting you know you're kind of um, psychologically under attack the emotional pressure is huge right yeah. huge i think with the before christmas or during christmas this log 4gs it's created an enormous you know uh, mobilization within organization but we cannot even begin to grasp not you know the pressure people face and mm -hmm. we can say well, this is part of the job but I think with the growing gap in the cybersecurity workforce, in the IT general, I think I read an article that one out of 10 uh, uh, CISOs or IT are leaving because of the, you know, the, the pressure in the environment. Mm -hmm. All this to say is we really have to rethink how we make cybersecurity, cybersecurity is a big part of it, but security in general, part of a, of a, of a safety first, security first organization without uh, without a barrier to innovation, without a barrier to people's life, but right. enhancing their life. And I think one of the, the factors that work in the, my line of work is because it helps people feel better. It gives them technical or practical strategies to enhance their focus and alertness. And at the same time, it has an impact on, 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 on their cyber hygiene behavior. But if you tell people you need to patch every day, you need to do this, you need to do this, or, you know, it's not necessarily going to, to, to resonate. So it's really a personalized tailored approach, oh. which can be skilled by rethinking how we provide training, right? There right. is any technology out there that can, you know, you can actually use VR immersive experiences to really skill these types of scenarios and training. I designed for that as well. And then you can roll it out across your organization without necessarily having a trainer or uh, someone every other month or every other quarter coming in. Wow, that's really like, that's great. I didn't realize that also was uh, something to utilize as well. 
Um, well, we're right at time. Uh, Nadia, thank you so much. It was really, really insightful and lots of great information and lots more to think about. Um, but where can people find you and connect with you um, and your services? Yes, so I always make a joke. New York is my favorite uh, town, but I say I live in Brussels, New York of Belgium. <laughs> That's <laughs> where I live. I work virtually uh, uh, um, as well. So uh, thrivewitheq.com, this is my website. I am someone who loves information sharing and education. So I have loads of resources and more to come as I share uh, as well. Uh, obviously, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, as you see, I love uh, uh, sharing uh, security and resilience from a very broad perspective. So I share also a lot of uh, very personal insights on how to build resilience. And, and share with me, you know, your, your um, engage and uh, I always love to learn about people's problems and people's challenges. But I, I really do because I am very solution oriented. Oriented, but I I, some, I think sometimes we forget that it's it's very different. For, we we have common problems, but it's experienced differently. And the better we listen, the better we understand, the better we can build a safer and secure digital footprint for not for only for ourselves, but also for our children. I, I'm also a mom, happily divorced. <laughs> nine years old and, and he doesn't have a mobile phone yet but it does scare me with what's yeah. going on with the social media with the, you know how much we become dependent on other people's uh, perception etc and i think this is where emotional firewalls comes in right no definitely well thank you nadia and we'll we'll include your uh, links to your site um also in the chat after the after the broadcast but thank you everybody for attending really appreciate the engagement and um We'll uh, continue the conversation. Bye. Bye. -bye.